Thanks, Cecil. Thanks, Mark. It's uh, awesome to be here at uh, the Dapper Virtual Day, and it's just an auspicious day, uh, the fifth anniversary of the public announcement of Dapper. And what I'm going to do this morning in the keynote is give you a background for how Dapper came to be and where I think it's going and uh, actually the progress that it's made in the last five years, which has just been tremendous. Uh, I know that a lot of you here are familiar with Dapper, but I also know that there's some um, people that are coming and learning about Dapper for the first time. So I'm going to try to give you newcomers a view of why Dapper is so awesome and why I think it's the future of cloud native computing. So why don't we go ahead and start right in and let me share my screen with you and we'll get to this backstory for Dapper. So again, it's five years old. And if you go back five years to 2019, what was happening back then was the rise of Kubernetes and the rise of cloud native computing and functions as a service was taking the world by storm. We also saw things like, an, like the actor model, the actor pattern. Um, and uh, Microsoft, for example, had its own actor framework or leans that powered the Halo service. One of the things that I observed when looking at how we get enterprise developers to be more successful and more productive developing microservice, cloud native applications, was looking at the landscape of what was there, the things that I've just talked about, and looking at opportunities to make it easier for people to do those things that they build these applications on top of those fundamental building blocks. When I looked at and thought about what developers really wanted and what they still want, is they want to be able to build resilient, scalable, microservice-based applications that gives them the agility, the ability to have an application that is always on, that can tolerate failures that you're going to see all the time in production systems, and failures that customers expect applications and services to survive through. They also like things like functions. The powerful aspect of functions was that they could focus just on their core business logic for event-driven execution of specific tasks. They didn't have to worry about setting up VMs, even setting up containers. They just provide a piece of code and the platform takes care of the rest. This is really the vision of serverless and cloud-native computing to, that really makes it possible for enterprise developers to just focus on getting their application written and not have to worry about all the other things that you really have to do to make something like that scalable and resilient. Also, the actor model, like I said, was very powerful programming model as well because it similarly took all of the burden of creating scalable, resilient, event-driven, stateful microservices and put that work in the platform as well so developers could just focus on the business logic of a stateful microservice. I think of actor mo of programming models or actor frameworks as uh, object-oriented microservices. They also, at the same time, want portability. This is something that I, I hear from just about every enterprise customer I talk to is that they're multi-cloud or they're on, on a primary hyperscale cloud and they're also on-prem and they want to be able to write apps that can move easily between those environments. In fact, what I'm seeing just in the last few years is a rise of regula regulation that is actually going to be mandating that applications get more portable for se different sectors like the financial sector. And one truism is that there's no programming language that rules them all. Different developers have different preferences with programming language, different uh, ecosystems of code are centered around different programming languages. And so it's just a fact of life that enterprises are filled with multiple programming languages and developers want to write in different ones and not be locked into a specific one to get value out of a platform. And then finally, the truth of the matter is if you came along with the most awesome framework and said, here's a great framework, but by the way, you can't use any of your existing code. It's just not going to get traction, no matter how valuable it is, just because there's so much existing code in enterprises that has to be leveraged and carried forward. And there's so much existing ecosystem code, libraries and SDKs that provide so much fun rich functionality that would have to be rewritten from scratch on a new platform. 
So back in 2019, again, looking at the world, the state of the world then, which is the state of the world now with respect to all of these requirements and desires for enterprise developers, I wrote a paper, a white paper on what we needed to do at Microsoft to make it easy for enterprise developers to write, addressing these requirements. Uh, at the time, I had a small office of the CTO and I had a couple of technical assistants, Jeroen Schneider and Hashi Bai. And we were brainstorming, how can we realize this and remove the fragmentation of these different microservice-based platforms where you're locked into a particular programming language for functions, a different one for actors, each one has different runtime capabilities and just provide uniform capabilities and support all of the different programming models with these uniform capabilities. And I remember vividly the day that Yaron and Hashi came into my office and said, hey, we wanna show you something. I walked into the conference room and they show me a demo. And this demo was of a sidecar that they'd created that allowed for service to service invocation through HTTP from one microservice to another microservice. And they also showed me a sidecar that allowed for one microservice to publish events into Azure Event Hubs and then be read from those Event Hubs from another microservice where the code in those microservices simply executed, or called on a very simple HTTP API. And the light bulb went off. And I realized that this was the key to solving these challenges that we've been presented and making it so po possible for developers to get that kind of focus on business logic that you get with functions and actors, but be able to use that wherever. Because this sidecar pattern uh, that we'd started ideating in 2019, the idea behind it was that we could build building blocks that would provide different sets of functionality. And I already mentioned a couple of them. But what you could do in that sidecar functionality is handle the authentication as one key requirement of, I need to go and authenticate to this other service. This is actually was inspired by Azure Functions bindings. In fact, that was one of the first building blocks for Dapper was bindings where you could pro perform an integration with another service and have the binding code sitting in the sidecar handle the authentication to the other service. So you as a developer wouldn't have to worry about managing a secret to do the authentication, managing a connection string to perform the authentication, that was configuration that was pulled up and used by the sidecar. And so we started to build up this suite of thinking about what can we do to flesh out this platform that would take the toil away from developers and put it in these sidecars, in the dapper sidecars, these building blocks. Now, I, one aspect of the building block that is key is that the concrete implementation of one of these building blocks is something that can be uh, instantiated at the time of deployment. So for example, I talked about PubSub and I talked about event hubs, but the powerful abstraction of this sidecar means that the code, the developer's code, doesn't care what PubSub service is being used by the sidecar. They just want a PubSub capability. And so what you could do with the sidecar is dynamically plug in or, in, or configure different components depending on the environment that you were deploying to that would instantiate concretely what that pub sub service would be. So for example, you could take a Dapper application that's using pub sub as building block as that HTTP sidecar and deploy it to Azure where it would use event hubs, turn around and have the sidecar use Kinesis when you're deploying to AWS and not have to change a single line of the developer's code because they're abstracted away from the details of the authentication and the service SDKs that that uh, are required to connect to those services and use them. One other aspect of Dapper in this initial launch is that we realized that, of course, Kubernetes was the microservices infrastructure of choice, uh, really taking the enterprise by storm. And so we wanted to make, make it so that you could deploy Dapper's runtime into a Kubernetes cluster and then leverage it just by annotating your Kubernetes manifests to inject the sidecar into your containers and therefore have those building blocks available to you very easily, as well as configuring the components with that uh, dapper configuration. But we also realized that 
a lot of developers wanted, we, we'd want to take advantage of Dapper's functionality independent of Kubernetes. Maybe you're in a, a serverless environment with a special uh, deployment system, or you want, uh, you've got an old piece of code that's sitting inside of a VM and you want to take advantage of Dapper's capabilities. So we created the self-hosted version of Dapper as well. And so these are some of the things that went out in that first 0.1 release in January of 2019. Uh, one of the things that you get out, uh, if you go back and take that list of desires and requirements is that you can use any language because any language that can use HTTP or gRPC can use Dapper. In fact, I, I loved showing a demo at Ignite in uh, November of 2019 of COBOL using Dapper because we got a version of COBOL that could talk to HTTP. So literally any programming language can use Dapper and take advantage of Dapper. You get functions as a service, as a programming model because Dapper has triggers and has bindings like Azure Functions do. You get, micro, you get a actor pattern because Dapper has actors built into it. You get long running microservices with tasks because Dapper supports you being able to take any piece of code, like I said, a piece of code running in a virtual machine that runs just indefinitely serving requests and that can leverage Dapper. So Dapper realizes the vision that we had set out for us of it's a uniform platform, a cloud operating system, I like to think of it, the cloud native, effectively the de facto cloud native API that is available anywhere and provides developers this ability to just focus on their code and let Dapper take care of the rest. And so that was kind of also the inspiration for the Dapper logo and the Dapper name is Dapper is like a butler that just takes care of these things for you. So that was the launch of Dapper back in 2019. We started developing it and we publicly released uh, on this day in 2019, the one release, like I mentioned, we immediately jumped to one uh, to a thousand GitHub stars, which was impressive. And we were watching Dapper's growth of GitHub stars versus other similar cloud native uh, platforms and, and SDKs inside of CNCF, and we saw it grow. And by the way, that's another thing that we did is signal at that point in time that we were going to submit Dapper to CNCF because along with those other, all those other requirements that I mentioned that enterprise developers had, one key one was it has to be open and it has to be in open governance. A lot of enterprise uh, CIOs, CTOs, developers that I talked to would actually tell me when I asked them about their cloud native strategy, a simple one word answer, CNCF. And that shorthand for it needs to be open, it needs to be open governance. And that's the only way that you can get a platform like this to take off is to make it open, make it so people can leverage it on other clouds besides just Azure, which is the, the cloud that brought it forward and be able to take it on-prem and be able to contribute to it. Uh, these are some of the and headlines from that initial announcement back at, uh, five years ago, uh, announcing Dapper for the first time to the world. And it's just, it's really uh, exciting to look back on these and see these headlines, which are still exactly relevant today for what we were trying to do and where Dapper's come. So the Dapper journey continued from that dot one release. We continued to develop it. We grew a Dapper team inside of Azure to contribute to it. We started working with uh, enterprise partners that also contributed to it and were working with us to take it to production and validate it. So companies like Ignition Group and Zeiss were some of the early adopters uh, of Dapper that we validated Dapper on and made sure it had production level capabilities. We had the momentous moment of the V1 release in February of 2021. At that point, Dapper had grown to include 70 components, six APIs, and those components span Kubernetes, resources, AWS, Azure, and GCP services. So we had full coverage of cloud and on-prem by that point across the building blocks. We had passed 10,000 GitHub stars, and then in November 2021, we submitted it to CNCF and jumped straight over Sandbox into incubating level, something that hadn't happened very often up to that point in CNCF. But really, it was a testament to the momentum that Dapper had, had by that point. Fast forward to now, there's 120 components, there's 11 APIs or, or building blocks inside of Dapper, so it's grown even richer. And 
excited to announce that the formal submission for CNCF graduation was submitted just a few days ago. Here it is, the pull request for it. So we expect Dapper to become a graduated CNCF project uh, literally in the next few weeks or months. Uh, so that is another kind of capper on this five-year journey that we've been on to bring Dapper out to the world and make it the de facto platform for cloud native computing. The community itself, so I've given you some idea of the community just in terms of the number of components and uh, that have been uh, created for Dapper because those components have been created by the community. You see there on the second column, there are 120 plus community com components. Dapper has grown to become the 12th largest CNCF project out of the 157 in CNCF, which is no small feat given the just how many projects are valuable in CNCF. You can see some of the other stats. We were up to 24,000 GitHub, GitHub stars. There's 3,700 contributors to Dapper at this point. And uh, like uh, I think Cecil mentioned, there's 7,700 Discord members that you can join if you haven't joined them already to talk about Dapper and get your questions answered. And then when it comes to enterprise adoption, I mentioned some of those early adopters, but the number of companies that are using Dapper has continued to grow. And you can just see some of the logos here of companies that are familiar to everybody that have actually shared their logo for uh, and for this purpose of saying we're using Dapper. Uh, so and there's one right there in the middle. It's Microsoft and Microsoft continues to use Dapper and continues to invest in Dapper. So uh, a few years ago, Dapper graduated from my incubations team into our developer division to become the substrate for Microsoft's uh, developer platforms. So if you're familiar with Azure container apps or you're familiar with Azure container instances, those or Azure Kubernetes service, all three of those have Dapper as an option as a managed component. So you can just go and say that you want Dapper included in ACA and it's there for you managed by us uh, so that you don't have to maintain and deploy it and update it. The same thing for ACI and the same thing for AKS and the, really that is the vision being realized here at Microsoft that Dapper is the substrate, it is the de facto cloud native operating system API. Now, just to give you an idea of the breadth that Dapper has gotten to, it's this picture looks very similar to the picture I showed you early and it actually I went back and looked at the initial blog post we released back in October of 2019. And this picture is just the same picture with more boxes in it. And so some of the things, the boxes here you say for the building blocks or the APIs are actors, outbox, job scheduling, service invocation, a key value store, pub sub, findings, secret management, configuration, crypto. Uh, there's things like leader election for concurrency. And one of the big ones. So one of the things that I, I think what we learned when going to talk to enterprises, it's very hard to get them to adopt something new. They really got to see value in it. And to me, the value of Dapper seems kind of obvious. Your developers can just focus on their code. Their code becomes more resilient. Their, their code is automatically instrumented. You see those boxes on the right because every Dapper API is integrated with OpenTel. So you get complete observability of every Dapper invocation and you can see the flows of requests go through your microservices. If they're using Dapper to talk to each other and to talk to services, they get security built in because mutual auth TLS is built into Dapper. They get resiliency because uh, circuit breakers and back off are built in as configuration options in Dapper. So they get all of this value. They get portability. They don't have to learn 15 SDKs. They can, they, uh, can focus just on their business logic. To me, the value proposition is clear. But when you go to actually talk to enterprises, a lot of times they've built their own sidecars. They've got a rich eco internal ecosystem that's similar to Dapper. And so they're like, well, you know, I already got some of those things out of what I built. What is Dapper going to do for me? Some of the things that we found that really resonate are PubSub, service to service invocation. And now the big thing that is really driving a lot of a Dapper uh, adoption is workflow, which was uh, introduced as a building block into Dapper not too long ago. Uh, actually, it was uh, initiated by us here at Microsoft of getting workflow built on the durable task framework, which underlies our, our functions and logic apps, for example, the workflows inside of them, to make that a building block inside of, of Dapper. And the reason this is workflow is actually a vision from the start of Dapper, because if you when you take a look at any non-trivial cloud native application or service, 
you'll see that inside of them, there's some workflow someplace. And that workflow is often just implemented as if then else statements and waiting for messages to proceed with some flow of, I need to do this, and then I need to do these things, and then I need to do that. That code is extremely brittle. And so what you've seen is some services actually build their own little mini workflow engines. Uh, and when I look across the services at Azure a few years ago, there was just a proliferation of custom workflow engines across all of the services. So realizing that, why don't we just make it so that there's a standard workflow building block, and then you could have workflow components plug in to implement different workflow engines if you wanted to, but from a developer perspective, I have a platform that I know I can just code up a workflow and that workflow is gonna be resilient and that workflow is gonna be uh, automatically scalable and it's gonna be very easy for me to use it and it's just gonna be there when I need it inside of my application. So that one is really resonating uh, with as, as a value proposition that by itself, we, I've seen enterprises say, I'm gonna go look at adopting Dapper just because of the workflow value that I can get out of it. And then all of these other things come with it. So there's literally something here for everybody. Um, and, but that said, I don't view this platform as being complete. And by the way, there's also SDKs and, and uh, apps, uh, language specific libraries to make it so that you can use Dapper, not just through raw HTTP or gRPC, but you can actually use idiomatic code in whatever language you want to, like Python, Go, Rust, even for uh, accessing the Dapper APIs. But it, it it's not done. And when we take a look at the Dapper use cases, whether it's incrementally adopting a piece of it, like service-to-service -service invocation inside of your microservices, long-running microservices, event-driven microservices, functions as a pattern, actor as a pattern, distributed applications. And now what is showing up is AI data pipelines and AI inference as Dapper use cases, where you can have uh, bindings to different services and orchestrate a pipeline across your microservices that are part of this AI inference or AI data pipeline. In fact, I think that really anything that you take a look at, any programming platform you take a look at, Dapper can serve as the foundation. But I want to talk a little bit about where I see Dapper going um, and some of the things that I say, think will flesh it out and make it even more useful. So one of them is introducing some building blocks that I think would be really uh, useful to flesh out and make it so that there's no reason to ever have to do custom or leverage SDKs specifically where you, the developer never has to worry about the toil of managing something that you could have managed with one of these building blocks because it's a, a common concern across all your applications. One of those is native integrations with cert certificate managers. Another one, and again, in this world of AI where so many apps are becoming AI enabled, it's just as obvious that Dapper should have a conversational API building block and a vector embedding building block as well. And so though both of those things are actually are already underway, but that will make a Dapper really useful in the world of agentic systems and AI generative AI driven systems. And then I think that there's still some work to do to flesh out beyond just KV store. Uh, so ANSI SQL store is something we've been talking about from the start of Dapper, blob stores, another one in document store building blocks or APIs are some other. And the reason that I mention this, by the way, is because some of these things are already in flight. So this is for you that are consumers of Dapper to know that these things are going to make Dapper even more useful to you. But also, a lot of you are developers that might want to contribute to Dapper. And so these are opportunities for you to go and contribute and influence the future of Dapper. And then one other aspect that I think it would be key to really opening up Dapper and getting rid of the, the kind of uh, reasons that I've heard for why not Dapper. One of them um, is if Dapper with its gRPC or HTTP means that there's data copies going across that boundary into the sidecar and back and forth, which for the kinds of APIs that Dapper's served up to now aren't a big deal. But when you take a look at Blob Store, for example, where you could be uh, wanting to transmit a blob of a large size, that overhead of that copy becomes significant. And so one of the things I've talked about actually with your own uh, for many years now is it would be awesome if we had GR zero copy gRPC. And by zero copy, I mean shared memory across the sidecar interface, which would mean that Dapper could place data into 
the, 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 or the app could place data into a shared buffer, uh, invoke Dapper on the other side, and Dapper then could just read the data in place without a copy. This would actually eliminate like six different memory copies that happen across gRPC when you go across that boundary to the sidecar and, and back. So that would actually eliminate even those last, hey, I don't like sidecars because it means data copy, it's inefficient. The other thing that a zero copy gRPC would open up is dynamically loadable Go libraries. So Go has uh, limitations around being able to dyna dynamically load modules. And that means today Dapper is effectively, uh, with some exceptions and some work that we've been doing to make it a little more pluggable, is that you basically get Dapper as one big chunk with all the components built into it. Now, ideally for both footprint as well as security surface area, as well as servicing requirements, you would just pull along the components that you want for your particular deployment. And if you had zero copy gRPC, that would enable dynamically loadable Go libraries, at least for the Go building blocks and components, you would uh, avoid having to uh, uh, pull those components in and, and statically link them into the, the the Dapper package. So with that, I hope I gave you an overview of Dapper, the Dapper vision, Dapper's origins, uh, the Dapper value proposition, a little bit of where I see Dapper going. Uh, I'm thrilled that we've got so much community around Dapper and there's so many people contributing to it and showing up here for the fifth anniversary of this. There's an awesome lineup today of talks. So I hope you stick around the rest of the day and, and get uh, learnings of, of Dapper and what it can do for you. Uh, look forward to everybody contributing to Dapper. Uh, again, it's a proud moment for me. It's a proud moment for, I think, your own, of course, and Mark Fussell, who's also part of Diagrid and was part of the early incubations team bringing Dapper to market. I uh, want to thank them for their contributed contributions over at Diagrid and, and for uh, sponsoring and hosting this uh, event, Dapper, and inviting me to keynote. So with that, I want to turn it back to uh, Mark and Cecil uh, to get the, get you on to your next uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mark. It's really great to see Nita how far uh, we've, we've come with Dapper and also uh, what, yeah, what still uh, lies ahead in the future. Uh, yeah, some very exciting stuff. And yeah, people are also, uh, yeah, also still surprised on how Dapper, Dapper offers so much different APIs. Uh, some people didn't know about the Outbox pattern yet, for instance, or about Dapper workflow. So yeah, it, it's great to see that we can reach out to so many different developers you know, doing all these, these different things and that Dapper can really help them. Amazing to see. Yeah, and one of the things I really appreciated about your talk is this particular slide that you're sharing right now about the um, Dapper Futures part, because I know a lot of folks in the chat were asking about AI features, vector stores, and all this types of stuff. So this is really good to see.